This is your host Apil Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us Steve Winterfeld, Advisory CISO at Akamai. Steve, it's great to have you on the show. It's excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and today we are going to discuss uh, the latest Akamai's state of internet report. As you are discussing before the interview start, that you folks, you know, of course, uh, come up with a lot of reports throughout the year. Uh, and security is becoming a very important topic, especially after the whole cloud adoption is no longer someone else's problem is no longer an afterthought. I mean, at least that's what we talk about. You know, it's moving in developer's pipeline. It's becoming a priority. Uh, so this is what we talk about. But since, you know, uh, <laughs> this is the area, this is your strength, I want to hear from you when you look at security in today's world. Do you see in reality it has become, you know, uh, a kind of uh, a priority? It is no longer someone else's problem. It's no longer, you know, an afterthought. Well, I will tell you that... Um you know, security is in the boardroom. We're having discussions uh, at the board level about, you know, what is our cyber risk appetite? Uh, that's a specific term within the financial security uh, or the financial industry that the security auditors are asking. And and so, yeah, it, it's starting at the, at the very senior levels. And then as we get down, more and more of us are starting to be involved with it every day. You know, when I talk to developers, you know, it is a matter of how do I develop hooks so they can pull in security capabilities as part of the pipeline. When I'm talking to, you know, people that are, are in startups, they're trying to figure out how they can be a startup and be secure and not lose all their IP right away. So, you know, security is becoming fundamental and we see so many examples of where it's compromised every day that, that you know, we're here at Akamai, we want to share some best practices and lessons learned which is why we put out reports on, you know, API security, DDoS, and uh, some by industries. We put out a commerce report and a financial services report, and ones like this, which is on uh, ransomware. Thanks for, you know, of course, sharing uh, the the state uh, where you know security is today. Uh, now let's talk about these reports. Uh, as you said, you folks keep do a lot of reports, but let's talk about the state of the internet report. Talk about the idea, the driver. Uh, because some of these reports not only just help us gain insight, but they also help us prepare to help our customers how they can secure them. So, so to talk about the, the, the whole idea of this report. One of the things that we are asked by our customers is, you know, what are my peers doing that I'm not that that's doing well? What's happening in my industry or what's happening in my region? Uh, and is it unique from others? And so, you know, that's why a lot of our reports were able since, you know, we see we're an international company. We have uh, customers across every time zone. We have customers in every industry. And so what we want to do is we want to say, these are best practices. These are lessons learned. And this is a trend we're seeing. You know, we're seeing a trend of, uh, in this case, you know, let's say, we went and we looked at, you know, 90 different ransomware groups. We studied victims across different groups, and we studied a time period of almost two years. I think it was 20 months total. And as we looked at all that, we want to come back and make recommendations. How should you be thinking about protecting it? Should you shift resources based on how the threat is shifting their attacks? And so those are kind of the things that, you know, as as we protect against the edge and internal, and we have, you know, a threat hunting team on our segmentation. We have shadow hunting team on APIs. We have a security operations center for DDoS. So we see so many lessons learned. We just wanted to share those. Can you share some highlights or when you folks do report you have been in industry for so long that you're like, hey, yeah, this is what is uh, happening. So you do know beforehand. And then some, sometimes there are some of the findings you're like, oh, okay, that's what. So, so talk about, you know, some some surprising elements and some that you're expecting that this is the trend in the security or threat space. So there were a couple aha moments that, you know, I was just like, wow, I, I just didn't, it doesn't necessarily surprise me, but I didn't see that one or I didn't see that one you know, coming that quickly. Uh, so one of the things for me was, you know, um, ransomware is based on extortion. So there are basically three models out there that are trying to to do that old extortion racket where, you know, I, you got to pay me or something bad will happen. And, and the first thing they want to do is DDoS extortion, you know, 
pay me or I'll, I'm going to take your site offline. Nothing to do with this report. The second extortion is I'm going to encrypt all your data so you don't have access to it. So operationally, you're shut down. And this is a hard one because, you know, I talk about the flash to bang. And if you've never heard of that, if you, you see a lightning strike every five seconds, you count before you hear the thunder, that's one mile away. So, you know, that flash to bang, if you lose credit cards, it could be six months. If you get hit by all your, your data is locked up and you're operationally shut down, you are immediately in crisis mode and it's public. And then the last thing is they're they're holding your data hostage. They're stealing the data and saying, you know, we'll sell it back to you. And so as we think about this, these are traditionally we think about, you know, somebody coming in, spreading throughout the network, exfilling data, and it's all been through, you know, hacking the people, you know, coming in through social engineering software. And this year we saw a shift to zero days. You know, the, they are actually, the, the hackers are, are developing zero days. They're paying bug bounties to other hackers to bring in zero days. And we're going back to more technical attacks. You know, you think about things like go anywhere and move it. You know, these are, are not trying to break in. And, and these are great attacks from the hacker's point of view because they scale. I break into one point and I get access to multiple customers. Uh, and... It's also changing the economy is getting much more complex. You know, I may be a hacker that just gets initial access. Somebody else may be a hacker that, you know, does actual ransomware. Somebody else may do the data exfil. You know, it, it, it is, you know, ransomware as a service almost. And it's also a very lucrative market and also sometimes low hanging fruit. When it, let's just talk about ransomware specifically. Uh, the fact is that the way we create, run, manage software has changed over time. Uh, the whole culture around it has also changed. How have you seen the methods of attack by ransomware? They have also changed, uh, which once again, based on your uh, research, as you said, you know, it's becoming more tech. Uh, it, it can be social engineering. There are so many ways attackers, you know, target uh, their, of course, targets. Uh, how you have seen it changing, evolving, where you're like, of course, to be honest with you, these are some of the smartest people on the globe, you know, as Linus once said, you know, these are the smart people. We want them on our side, not on the... So, so talk a bit about how you have seen the evolution of uh, uh, these attacks. They're smart and they're innovative. You know, they're constantly changing. So they may focus on a specific industry that they know is more likely to pay. So let's say healthcare or critical services may be more likely to pay a ransomware attack. Uh, and, and we may focus on, you know, scale, trying to go in and do automated attacks. And, and where we saw here is 143% increase in zero-day attacks. So just launching malware, then that malware will break in versus, you know, trying to send you uh, an email. So if somebody sent me an email and, and they said, hey, Steve, you know, go to this website and you can get a new uh, Frisbee for disc golf, which is my passion. Well, I'm, I'm going to go to that site, click, get my free Frisbee. They're never going to send it to me, but they will download that malware. That's how they used to do it. And now they're less dependent on the person and able just to directly attack, which allows them to, to scale faster. These days, we talk a lot about generative AI. Of course, chat GPT is there. Do you also see that, or you're already seeing that some of these attackers are also using some of the generative AI technologies for the attack, or you're not seeing that is happening yet? Obviously, our tools use AI, more machine learning than generative AI. But across these, you know, I'm, I'm seeing those tools being used for both good and bad. And so on the generative AI side, uh, I think that's really going to have a big impact on business email compromise, more so than ransomware. It's going to allow people to to quickly and and more effectively convince people to you know wire money or to to do something like that. Uh, so I do see that approaching quickly. I see versions of deep fakes and versions of that voice AI uh, where they're able to mimic being used again for business email compromise. And 
I, I think eventually we'll see more of that in the ransomware or general breach categories. But yeah, I think that is going to be a powerful tool. And as you were just saying that most of these were like, you know, zero day vulnerability. Also, when we look at, uh, you know, ransomware, uh, I think encryption, you know, they encrypt, you know, as I said, you said, you know, it could be network, it could be your whole data. That was their, you know, preferred model. Is that still the case or it has changed a bit? Well, and what you've seen is, you know, it's a two-phase model. So they, they want two paydays. And so originally it was come in and encrypt and we'll give you a key. Uh, now it is come in, you know, spread, be able to encrypt everything. But while you're spreading and, and making sure you're able to shut everything down, exhaling data. It could be contractual data, customer data, something that they don't want to have go public. And so once you've, you've gotten that, then you hold that data hostage. And we're seeing that more and more companies uh, are, are having them focus on that. And I have to assume that hackers focus on where they can make more money. And so we're seeing this shift to data being held hostage as the focus over encryption. Um, and even to the point where they're going to go to your customers and say, hey, you know, Bank X is your bank. We took all their data. You need to call Bank X and tell them to pay us so we don't release your data. So they're actually going to the, the second order victim and telling them to go back to the, the victim and tell them, hey, pay these ransomware people so they don't get our data out. Which I think, again, going to, to innovation is great. It makes me sad that we're in this world, but yeah, it, it's kind of where we're seeing this shift. As you work with your customers and when you work on these reports and of course, getting a lot of insights, uh, what kind of, Awareness are you seeing there where organizations, you know, they are like aware of that, hey, there are these kind of risks or they just wake up only when they are actually attacked? So I will say that, you know, uh, situational awareness, visibility is the holy grail. We're all looking for that. We're all trying to figure that out. But, but the one thing that was kind of another aha moment for me was, as you're dealing with an attack, as you're focused on mitigation and recovery, other organizations, other criminal organizations are more likely to come in and attack you. So we saw that it's six times more likely to experience a secondary attack within three months of the initial attack. So I felt like, you know, if I just got through a big breach, you should <laughs> give me a chance to rest. But that's not the reality. It's almost like as you're dealing with this crisis, you need to have part of your team focused on the next group trying to break in because it is constant. And, and that, to me, really means we need to relook at our playbooks. We need to rethink because having been involved in, in some incidents like that, you get very myopic focused. You're, you're focused on this one crisis. And I think we have to train ourselves to not only focus on the current crisis, but look for the next upcoming attack. And that's a perfect segment to my next question, which is that uh, you talked about playbook. Of course, uh, we don't have time for you to share the whole playbook, but uh, what advice you would have for organizations? And also you said, you know, myopic view, because in the security space, it's very the popular uh, you know, night lamp, you know, that you're looking where you expect problem will happen. But as you said, you know, the good guys, as I say, the, the bad guys have to be right only once. And as a good guy, you have to be right all the time. That's the big difference. So, so talk about uh, what advice you have for organizations that not only they, once they get the pin the target on their back, they will be attacked again and again and again, but is there something that they can do culturally or practice-wise that will at least offer them a greater level of protection? And that's why I like to talk about the cyber kill chain. And if you go something like the MITRE attack framework, the top of that attack framework, all the steps are reconnaissance, gain access, execute your payload, you know, set up command and control. If you stop any one of those, you're going to break the chain of attack. And so I'd like to think they have to get it right multiple times to be successful, and we have opportunities to stop them. And so how do we do that? You know, the first is understand your attack surface. 
you know, make sure that, that you minimize your attack surface and then be looking both north, south, and east, west. You know, have internal segmentation and visibility internally. So as they try to spread, you detect that. Next is, you know, update your playbooks. Make sure they're validated through exercises. You know, it, it's incredible that, that you go through, if it's a tabletop, if it's a technical exercise, you get leadership expectations right, you know who's involved. Those playbooks have to be validated. And almost quarterly would be, be you know, if you have a quarterly exercise, you'll get through all your critical playbooks. You know, next, we, we have these indicators of compromise. You know, it might be coming through DNS, it might be coming through, you know, war traffic. You need to really kind of do a gap assessment and say, how am I able to monitor outbound traffic? How am I able to monitor internal data flows to discover indicators of compromise? The next is kind of a different one. You know, it's the traditional cyber hygiene. Are you patching? Are you doing security training? Uh, those basic things that we should be doing. And finally, outside of the security team, work with your legal team because we're seeing more and more laws come out that says, if you live in this state or if you live in this region, it is illegal to pay a ransomware or you have to notify if you do or, you know, and so make sure your legal team is plugged into the regulations in that environment so you don't do something inadvertently that's not not within the law. Uh, I also want to talk about one thing more, which is, uh, I think, important in when it comes to security is also culture. Uh, can you talk about, I mean, you did touch on that, but why is also important for companies to kind of build a culture from top down? So because security doesn't become an isolated problem, it, as you said, it will take your company down immediately. Your brand is tarnished. Of course, your customers can also get compromised. So is it also a good idea to build a culture within organizations so that it's not a DevSecOps problem? You know, ultimately, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. Uh, and so, you know, if, you, if your culture is not one that you expect everybody to be responsible for understanding the risks they're taking, then they're, they're going to be aggressive. And so I don't want security blocking. I don't want security stopping. Um, but I also want everybody thinking about it. And, um, you know, it, it's that integrated security at the beginning of a project that works. You know, it's, it's that culture of I, I'm starting something, so I, I'm reaching out to the right security people. And, and I think if you don't have that culture and you're trying to bolt on security at the 11th hour, it's never going to work. So, yeah, I can't say enough about, you know, security advocates or, you know, security experts being embedded throughout the, that, um, just critical. So enable, your, enable everybody to understand that, that risk. When it comes to security, depending on how you talk to, it is intimidating, it's complex. And as the landscape is evolving, as you said, it is overwhelming for customers and our users to all the time focus on security and be worried about it. I feel that they should focus on writing business applications, focus on business, business, adding business value. Can you talk about you know, how, of course, uh, companies like Akamai help them, once again, to, to <laughs> continue to focus on what they are good at doing and kind of remove some of these burdens. At the same time, they should also not, you know, be totally isolated from the real world. So they have to maintain a balance between keeping themselves updated, awareness should be there, education should be there. At the same time, leaving them enough time, their developers, they can focus on uh, their core jobs. Listen, I'm in security is my focus and I can't keep up. I mean, I'm constantly, someone will say, did you know? And I'm like, no, and it came out six months ago. And so it, it is overwhelming. And so the first thing I would encourage people to do is how do you learn? Uh, are you going to subscribe to podcasts? There's some great podcasts out there. Are you going to get some some news feeds? You know, uh, again, you know, great news feeds. They're, they're the classics, Bruce Schneier, uh, Brian Krebs. Um, those kind of people that that you just want to trickle in because you're gonna, it's gonna keep your continuous learning going enough in security that that you're not falling too far behind. Um, 
some critical vendors. Uh, IBM, we were just part of an IBM report. We're part of the uh, Verizon data breach report every year. We put out our own reports. So pick some of the vendor reports you like, but then don't forget there are other. There are, you know, here in the United States, we have a Department of Homeland Security puts out advisories. Um, you know, maybe go to InfraGuard or OWASP or some of these security focus groups and become a member of them. And then, you know, finally, the, the bigger ones, you know, uh, you know, watch a video on the MITRE attack framework. Watch a video on uh, the OWASP top 10 for API attacks. And if you just kind of make it enough of yours, like 10% of your time is involved with this side, I think that's probably the practical answer for me. Steve, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, share great insights about security. Uh, and as you folks, you know, keep coming up with these reports, I would love to have you back on the show because security is, you know, as you said, you know, so things are changing and there is always something happening. So I would love to have you on the show again, but I really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I look forward to coming back and I encourage people to to go and download the, the state of the internet reports and our blogs and and we're looking forward to collaborating on security.